One thing's for sure, though, it, the championships may have been decided in MotoGP and Moto3. It's all looking incredibly exciting for next year, uh, as we've been saying uh, since the start of this season, really. Uh, but let's uh, touch on Moto2 as well. I know we've already uh, skirted around the subject, uh, but that championship does go down to the final. Uh, the gap is now 23 points. So Remy Gardner only needs three points in Valencia to be crowned Moto2 title. Um, and, and it seemed like I, we've, t- we've talked t- talk about tyres, you know, it, people hate talking about tyres sometimes, but it did seem it was very crucial uh, this weekend in particular. It just seemed like perhaps Ralph Fernandez made the wrong call with that t- tyre choice, do you think? Yeah, he did. And I think he knows that. That's why he looked pretty mardy in um, part firme at the end of it when he spoke to Simon Crayfar. I think mm. that, yeah, he, he did know that. And I think that they just didn't expect it to be... I mean, he was fast. I mean, you see the way he was able to run into some of the corners, you know, but I think crucially where it cost him dearly was that double right running onto the front straight. You know, every time Remy had got like yards on him, he was able to put the, apply the power and, and, you know, it pushed forwards, which is what you want from a tyre, obviously late race. Yeah, it was a mistake. But one that, given the, the, the slight time constraint that he had, um, meant that he didn't go through a full race distance the 23 lap four i think he only had 11 or 12 laps on a on a the softer option tire whereas sam lowes and uh, remy gardner had prepped just that little bit they had the opportunity should i say um to to do full race distance you know sam knew that, that, that there was no other tire for him other than the hard and and obviously you know remy remy was a concurred with that but if you look through the the tire list there was a fair few people that are running soft softer rears um it's probably something like 60 40 in in favor of um of the of the soft tire i think and it is a track where believe me luck does come into it there it can happen and it's a one-line racetrack as well pretty much it's very very hard to pass there so it's a i i'm i it sounds like i hate valencia valencia is a wonderful city and it's a great race meeting but the track is not the one i'd want to finish the season on it's you know I'm quite looking forward to when we go back to Japan, Sepang and Australia mm. and some of the classics that we um, we need to be back at again. But to finish in Valencia, I've always thought is a real damp squib at the end of the year. Oh, what is a damp a squib. squib anyway? Yeah. Apart from <laughs> I was going to ask you for your insider's guide, but I think you've just given us a rather damning report of, uh, <laughs> of Valencia. It's going to ru- I've just checked the weather. It's going to rain as well. So it really will be damp. So it's not going to be... Do you know, I, I, I genuinely thought I'm going to ring up my mate Julian Ryder because it, 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 I, to see Valentino Rossi is his last race meeting is, a, is an important mm. thing in your life history, if you like. And, to, and, and and I thought I'll ring Julian up and see if he fancies a trip. And then I thought about it. Do I want to be in, I don't mind being in Valencia. It's just the track I don't really fancy being at. It's a, it's a cold <laughs> cavern of concrete. Um, it really is. I mean, you can see you can see everything from everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter where you sit, but you're sitting in, on cold concrete. Or it's the it's the biggest track you can get in the smallest area. I mean, whoever designed it did a brilliant job. Um, but it's just not the racetrack for a MotoGP bike, I don't think, especially the, the final round of it at the end of the season. Valencia as a city is brilliant. Uh, links into the track are brilliant. You know, it's a really easy track to get into and get out of. Um, highly recommend it as a as a as a destination. And if it was sort of mid-season when it was a bit warmer, um, yeah, I can understand that. But to have it, that racetrack as the final round when it can bring in bad luck, you know, in the weather and, and, and the like, nah. Well, we're all really looking. One, but there you go. Someone must be paying loads <laughs> gonna, of money. Because they were all, all really say. looking forward to it now. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's... Uh... Well, we've well, still got a world championship right. to be won, Harry. Let's just, what well, we've, Gardner and Fernandez aside, uh, Pete, Sam Lowe's was back on the podium. Cameron Bobby was looking quite feisty as well. So, you know, that's looking good for him next season as well. But good to see Lowe's back on the podium. Aaron Connett in uh, fourth. And um, commentary seemed to think he had a jump start, but nothing investigated there. So uh, it seems he just got an absolute blinder. Well, uh, let's remember, if Lowe's had had one more lap, it probably would have passed Fernandez mm. and the title would have been over. I mean, it, it, it was getting close at the end there, wasn't it? And now, uh, as Keith explained, Remy's got to go through this whole tense weekend in Valencia <laughs> with cold, damp weather. You know, it's, it's, I think he'd be glad to see the chequered flag, when he? I mean, I'm sure he'll be hoping the best thing from Remy's point of view will be if 
if Sam, who seems to be on great form again now, can just run away at the front. Because as Keith said, if Fernandez doesn't win the race, then the title is decided. So maybe if, if Sam or Bezeki or someone like that does, you know, escape, Remy will be able to to enjoy the race a bit more than perhaps he might otherwise, because it'll just be county down laps, won't it? I would think. And yes. he's beaten up as well, Remy. You've got to remember that. You know, he's he's taken a fair old clattering and he's got over this weekend's race, but you tend to do that when you've had fresh injury. You know, you kind of you've 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 got yourself but by the time tomorrow morning comes and he's as stiff as an old, you know, leather chair, he's gonna feel pretty bloody sore tomorrow. And he ain't got long before he's got to be back on. And when you're in a cold country and it's wet, you know, and all your bones creak. I know he's young and he's not like me, where I have to, I'm at 90 degrees until I've brushed my tweet, teeth <laughs> twice. I can't even say it right. <laughs> but it's it's old injuries and injuries that he's carrying now into that final round. He's going to feel that. He's going to have to dig in deep to, to get this job done. But you're right, Pete, 100% right. He just loves Sam Lowe to be in the best form of his life this coming weekend and everyone else. And the thing is, with with an end of season type thing, we've been here before. I've said this before. I mean, you, you always you always get to the final final rounds and you like Quattararo, for instance, he's got the job done now. You would think Portimao, yeah, he's got to be bang on for winning that race. You get this mix up that, that comes the final round, particularly with the weather being uh, tricky like you think it's going to be, Harry. Um so I think that poor old Rail Fernandez is he's just gonna to have to throw every bit of caution at the wind. And I think that throwing every bit of caution at the wind probably should have been done in Portimao. If he'd been if he if he had a little I, I mean I'm, you can't really tell whether he just started to roll out of it a little bit, just tried he was close enough with two or three laps to go to stay with Remy Garda and try and spoil his end of end of uh, race laps. Um, but he didn't. Um, he took the discretionary route. It looked like. Thing is, again, he's such a great rider. You couldn't see how much he was struggling with the tire. You can't with the great riders. They can feel it, and they know where the edge of it is and where where disaster is about to come from. And so I, I feel that Fernandez was probably in a bit more trouble than we're giving him credit for with that softer rear tire. So he wasn't prepared to push it any harder. And the problem is as well when you've got a tire that's dropped off. It's not just about grip forcing you forwards. It's about grip on the overrun as well. You can you can have a an off throttle high side pretty quickly in some of those hairpins if you're not real careful. Um, and I think that was something that Jack Miller was talking about. I mean, he went back. He t- he wound his engine braking right back when he started to lose grip at the rear end. You know, you got too much engine braking, and all of a sudden the thing's backing itself in, you know, violently. Um, so you have to back off. It's like taking taking your foot off the back brake rather than using it. Don't know, Valencia. <laughs> Well, either way, both of the uh, KTM riders will be making their step up to MotoGP next season. And Ben has asked, comparing both KTM riders, Keith, uh, who would you say will suit the GP bikes more? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not really into speculation. Um, <laughs> I, I have to say that it, it's bad enough when you know the, what they're doing. Yeah, you, know, you can get it so bloody wrong when you when you think you know what you're talking about, let alone when you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I think that with that kind of speculation, you can't tell. I, I use the Quattararo analogy, if you like. Then I mean, he'd won one race officially, two races unofficially in Moto Two. Didn't look to me like he was the you know going to be the man for for running a motor gp bike and look what happened when he got on it he got on it and he really felt the yeah, affinity that that closeness with the bike he, he and it were, were immediately friends and you might find that again rail fernandez has got a real talent has he got more talent than remy gardner has got a real talent has he got more talent than remy gardner wayne good old dad who i've known for years and has always banged the drum about how remy wayne good old dad who I've known for years and has always banged the drum about how Remy is really good on the bigger and faster bikes, you know, the stuff back in the day. Um, so Fernandez looks to me like the real deal. Remy Gardner might step up to MotoGP and surprise us all. He might be the next Quattararo. You just don't know. Um, Remy, for me, has, has ridden better, has come better than I thought he was going to. And I think... I don't think I was alone in that. I mean, that's not to be disrespectful to, to Remy, but he kind of thrown himself at the scenery a few times. He kind of tried very hard on motorbikes that weren't really quite the real deal. 
Um, but of course, as soon as he stepped into that IO camp, it's looked good. And I think with with the way that it's heading, I think Remy, Remy, they're both going to be real weapons. I think again, I think it's a it's a it's a superb deal for both of them and and for the team they're riding for. I think we, we're going to have a twenty twenty two. I mean, like a friend of mine asked me seven years ago when I first started getting back into MotoGP, you know, can it can it can it really be better again next year? Can it get better than next year? Every year it has got markedly better, not just a little bit better. You know, every class, MotoGP particularly, has just got better and better. We were talking about qualifying for qualifying earlier on. You could predict who the two were that were going to go through qualifying one straight into qualifying two every time. You know, you could just say, yeah, it's going to be so and so and so and so. No problem at all. Because everyone under that wasn't on a motorcycle or wasn't up to the speed that that the two guys that you knew were going to go through. Now, it's pretty much anyone in qualifying one can make their way through to qualifying two. It's that tight. Um, and it's going to get tighter next year. I think KTM are going to, I think KTM have, have got to step up. They've, they've, they've got to make a step. They've lost their, since they lost concessions, they've kind of not gone that next, next step. And next year they're going to have to. And I think that will be the question mark for for Remy and Raul is how well they adapt to the KTM, which at the moment is not the easiest bike. You know, it's not not like the Yamaha, is it? Let's say, you know, Quattararo and Binder and and those kind of guys. And I think Michael Lacona was explaining this weekend because, of course, he's 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 going out to MotoGP. He's only 21. He's only a bit bit older than than Raul Fernandez. He's younger than Remy and he's he's already done two years and, and he's out. So. Um, you know, he's explaining that the KTM is not, it's, a, it's not an easy bike to ride and you do need time to, to sort of understand it. Um, and yeah, you know, he's, he's run out of time. He's coming good now. You know, Petrucci, his teammate was saying that in his opinion, since August, Lacona has been the best KTM rider. I mean, that was quite a statement, but, um, you know, taking into account things like he, he doesn't have, it seems they don't have the same package at Tech that they do at the factory team and things like that. But it just goes to show that it, you know, the KTM is not an easy bike, and that will be a big thing as far as who is the best out of Remy and Raul, how well they can adapt to the KTM. But well, how lucky a KTM, how lucky a KTM, Harry, to have two riders of that stature pushing each other to the nth degree. I mean, that's the key to a team. Brilliant. It, it, it is. Everyone's spoken about, you know, is it an unfair that, you know, Laquona has been sacked off? So, you know, it, so it, it, when he's so young, but when you look at the, we've talked about it time and time again, the sheer amount of talent that there is coming up through the ranks, there's, there's going to be sort of sacrificial lambs almost. <laughs> it, it feels like that kind of sort of scenario here. But um, if, well, if their fight in Moto2 is anything to go by, it's going to be uh, a very tasty one to watch uh, next season of MotoGP as well. Uh, right, we are running out of time, but there is enough time um, because we've already looked ahead to uh, how depressing Valencia is going to be, Keith. Um, so <laughs> who are your predictions? Because I can tell you the title fight is going down to the final race because you two are both tied with eight points coming into the final race we don't need to worry about me uh, but i think it was unfair <laughs> that uh, marquez uh, we should have we should have redone them in, in light of the marquez news um but give us your top three actually you know what i'm gonna go first um because <laughs> I, I, I haven't been first in a while so i'm going i'm actually going for a carbon copy of this weekend i'm going banyaya mir and uh, miller that's my top three and i'm locking that in who wants to go next who's ready <laughs> Sign okay, it. Well, it, on, I was going to say, Pete. I'm, I'm going to go for Mia to to win his first race Ooh, of the season. Okay, yeah, I'll, go, I'll go with that. Oh, <laughs> you know what? I was going there as well. <laughs> <laughs> he got the win there last year, didn't he? And he's you know he's he's arriving on form again now. So you know he's on a bit of a high there. I think Van Yaya, I think I'll go for second because he just seems to be fast everywhere. And I think because of the weather, I'm going to say Miller because I think if the weather's a bit dodgy, Miller will be will be up there. So he's my safe bet in case uh, in case the weather should uh, take a turn. Okay, go on then, Keith. Are you gonna are you gonna stick well, with me as your winner? I mean, it's no good going with the same person. Otherwise, we're going to bloody <laughs> end up bloody on the same points at the end. Yeah, of the, you two have got to year. have drastic, uh, drastically different uh, uh, predictions. I, 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 I'd rather lose than equal. You. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to go Miller. <laughs> Okay. Miller. I'm going to have Miller, Bang, Naya, Mia. Okay. No Yamaha in there. No Yamaha. Well, yeah, well. And no, my, thinking behind that, the... my thinking behind that is it's a long way down to turn one. 
and them Ducatis, if they qualify well, are just going to disappear down to there, and there ain't going to be an opportunity for a Yamaha to get by once we get going. Mm. Before we go, Harry, can I can I just give a big up to to some British journalists over in um, Portimao? Absolutely. Uh, we had a disaster. We're recording this on Sunday evening after the event, of course. And yesterday, um, in the traffic system outside the, the track, a police motorcyclist, uh, First Sergeant Jao Fernandez, was sadly killed when he hit a taxi who had one of the journalists that um, we know fleetingly from the, the press room, uh, Lucio Lopez, who's been injured, um, is in hospital and hopefully he will recover and be okay. We don't know any details on him at the moment. But Jalva Fernandez, the, the police sergeant, was killed in what was a horrendous situation when the motorcycle that, that Mr. Fernandez was driving, riding, crashed into the taxi and caught fire immediately. Um, and... Lucio was in the car and Simon Patterson, who you will have heard me mention, not perhaps quite as respectfully as I'm about to mention him, that's for sure. Simon Patterson was one of the first on the scene. He saw in his rearview mirror the, the, the car and the bike explode. He, David Goldman and Gareth Harford, who are Crash.net, they, they, I think they're contributors to Crash.net, still photography, but Golden Goose, you'll know, as the, the photography team, they were on site there as well straight away. And, and, also, there was, uh, I'm just thinking, was Jack Fearman, that was it, from Bike um, Magazine was there as well. They were the, the four Brits, basically, managed to get Lucio out of the car. So I, I just wanted to say a, a big up to those those guys. You know, Simon Patterson ended up having to go to hospital through smoke inhalation and the like. So, Simon, we're really proud of you. It's not often that we can talk about bravery in the press office, but uh, on this occasion, brilliant job. Sad that, that um, the... Uh, policeman was killed but of course um thanks to you guys i mean we're really really thankful that um you had the balls i think is what i'm saying there are men that run in and men that run out and i'm glad that um simon patterson and his crew were the ones that ran in and uh and did the good thing so um we're really proud of you simon absolutely and all our thoughts uh, are out there with you guys and everybody who was involved with that as well um that does just about bring us uh, towards the end but uh, we'll be back in a few days time for valencia uh, but before i i go i just wanted to uh, say that uh, i discovered something on twitter the other day um and it was to do with uh, i think a world superbike race that was held in mexico many <laughs> many years ago at a bit of a dodgy mexican circuit don't go there <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but I had to take a screenshot because I watched the coverage of it, which was hosted by our very own Mr. Keith Hewitt. And I'm going to show it to the camera there. Look at that. The blonde <laughs> locks on that. We'll get a better image uh, it's not if the you're watching locks. this. It's, it's the jacket and the tie. It's also, it? it's the out. Yeah, why don't you dress that smartly for these? I really think we should have a strict dress code on here. Thank you very much. I look but like I fell out a washing machine. <laughs> it was i had to i watched the entire 10 minutes it was in it was just so incredible to watch and uh, you, should have, you should have put julian Ryder up as well did you see that julian Ryder I, yeah. and chris herring chris herring was on that show as well the man who was patronus and uh and uh, carl fogarty the honda britain bloody PR, yeah and part of the circuit of wales promotion back in the in those um, <laughs> ill-fated days so it was excellent but you know what i'm gonna do if you're listening to us do go and check us out on youtube because i'm going to get our editors no. to to edit in the, <laughs> the video over Don't. this as we're talking so uh you it will be one to watch absolutely but for now my thanks as ever uh to keith you and pete mcclown and you our dear listener we shall return with you uh this time next week uh, for more MotoGP chat to end the season. Uh, and you can keep up to date in the meantime with all the very latest, as usual, on Crash.net. Any questions, send them in all the usual ways. Leave them in the comments section. Tweet, Instagram, Facebook. Just search Crash MotoGP. And please do leave us a review. Lots of reviews coming in on Apple Podcasts after my call out last week. So keep them coming in. Really nice to see you enjoying the show. Uh, and we shall see you uh, right back here next week from all of us. Bye-bye. <laughs>